Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host, and with me, as always, is the founder of Word on Fire, an auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, welcome. Brandon, it's always a great joy to be on with you. In the last episode, we talked about your upcoming trip to the Philippines. You're heading over there in about a week here at the end of January 2016 for the International Eucharistic Congress, and you're going to be giving three talks there. One is the main doctrinal talk on the Eucharist to thousands and thousands of people, and then you have a a breakout session on the new evangelization, and then you're giving a third talk to a bunch of the youth in Cebu City in the Philippines, and this talk you're giving is on the three paths to holiness. It's a a structure that you've used many times over the years uh, in your teaching through Word on Fire and elsewhere. And we went in depth into your other two talks in the last episode, but in this episode, I want to uh, spend a lot more time on these three paths to holiness. Um, the great French poet Leon Blo said that the only tragedy in life is not to be a saint. Now, talk a little bit about this idea that we're called to be saints. I know not a few Catholics kind of hear that and they think, oh, you know, I I could never be a saint. You know, I'm not as good as those super holy men and women, but we're all called to be saints. Is that right? Absolutely. And that quote from Léon Blois is wonderful because it revolutionized the life of uh, the young Jacques Maritain, you know, the greatest Catholic philosopher of the 20th century. And Maritain, as a young man, had decided that if he couldn't discover the meaning of life, Within a year, he would kill himself. He was a kind of despairing, you know, French uh, academic. And he was caught up in all the materialism and relativism of that time. And he resolved. He said, well, I'll give myself a year to find what makes life meaningful. If I don't find it, it's, it's curtains for me. Well, during that year, he stumbled across a number of interesting people. But one of them was Léon Blois, whom he knew personally. And um, that quote that you just gave... Il n'y a qu'une seule tristesse dans la vie de ne pas être saint. There's only one sadness in life, not to be a saint. Uh, revolutionized uh, Maritain. And I'll tell you why, I think. If you let it sink in, it will shift all your priorities around. Most of us go through life and we have a set of priorities of, you know, what makes life meaningful, what we want. Uh, I want success. I want a good family. I want power. I want uh, fame. You know, the usual suspects. But when you, you get Blois' point, there's only one real sadness. So, well, I didn't become the political figure I wanted to be. Nah, okay. I didn't make the money I, I wanted to make. Yeah, all right. You know, I didn't get as famous as I hoped I'd be when I was a kid. Yeah, so what? Those aren't real sadnesses. The, the one sadness is not to be the person God wants you to be. See, and if you get that, then you get the other ones too. What I mean is you know what to do with all those things. You know how to handle fame. You know how to evaluate fame and money and power. So, I mean, so once you get what Léon Blois saw, your whole life will change. And it was true for Maritain. You know, he gave the rest of his life to the service of Christ. Maritain, who'd spent long hours of vigil up at Sacré-Cœur and Montmartre, well, that was born of what he got from Léon Blois. And I would argue if anyone gets that, their life will change because it'll find its proper equilibrium. See, that's what it means to be a saint. The trouble is we think canonized saint, which is fine. I'm I'm glad we have canonized saints. They're they're meant to inspire the rest of us. But don't worry about that. Don't worry about the church officially canonizing you. Worry about doing what God wants you to do. Now, bring in my great spiritual hero, uh, the little flower. That's the little way, isn't it? Is becoming a saint, but but in a way that the world's not going to notice, most likely. But Every day, you have the opportunity to engage in some simple act of love. And that's what it means to follow God's will. Once you get that, everything else falls into place. And that's, that's the importance of Blois. Why I talk about that first path, we'll get onto it uh, soon, of finding the center. That's what it means. Finding the center. And now, let things fall into place around the center. But if you don't get the center right, then it'll be a, it'll be a mess. Now, we talk about becoming a, a saint, maybe with a capital S, as in being canonized by the yeah. church. But as you say, yeah. we're all called to be saints, maybe with a lowercase s. H- how would you define a saint? What is a saint? 
Well, you know, and that's where this whole thing comes from. Many, many years ago, the U.S. Catholic magazine, this is, oh, maybe even almost 20 years ago, asked me to write an article. You know, for, it's for a popular journal. Um, what does it mean to be holy? So I thought that through and came up with these three paths. They're not unique to me by any means. They're, you can find them in almost all the great spiritual teachers. Namely, to find the center, to know you're a sinner, and to realize your life is not about you. That's what it means to be a saint. Now, whether anyone notices or the church officially recognizes, that doesn't really matter so much. But have you found the center, meaning what Leon Blois saw? There's only one real sadness, not to you know, do what Christ wants you to do. Secondly, in light of finding the center, you know you're a sinner. It's impossible. You can't turn toward the light without becoming more aware of the smudges on the windshield. But then having acknowledged and dealt with your sin, now you're ready to be sent, sent on a mission. Your life isn't about you. There are people that are 85 years old, and they're still convinced their life is about them. Well, that's a tragedy. So to be holy is to find the center, in light of that experience, know you're a sinner, Having dealt with sin, now go on mission. Your life's not about you. I think that's what it looks like uh, to be a saint. I really like these paths to holiness because they kind of provide a structure for any type of saint. You know, St. Therese uh, in her book, Story of a Soul, said that uh, the saints kind of are like different flowers in a field, that they're each distinct. They each have their own form of holiness, but they nevertheless are in the same field, so they have the same structure and pattern. So these three paths provide that structure for us. Let's look at the first one, finding the center. When you talk about this, you often use the image of a rose window, like the great window in the Notre Dame Cathedral, saying that it's like theology in glass. So how does the rose window symbolize this idea of finding the center? As you know, um, I've got a great affection for those rose windows and um, the great north rose at Notre Dame which I saw literally the first day I arrived in Paris and became just a a compelling symbol for me. What I'm noticing here is the beauty of the window. And Aquinas says, you know, that beauty occurs at the coming together of integritas, consonancia, and claritas, Latin for wholeness, harmony, and radiance. The rose window is about one thing. It hangs together, integritas. Think of the integrity of a good golf swing or a good um, jump shot. I remember uh, my basketball coach many, many years ago showing us a picture of uh, John Havlicek. I'm dating myself here. He's a, he's a basketball player from olden days, but he had this beautiful form, a beautiful form in his jump shot. And he showed us how every element you know, fit together and the shot was one. That's why it was so effective. And how our jump shots were all over the place, you know, and elbows going here and hips going there. and So something beautiful has integritas. Well, that's the beautiful soul that's found the center in Christ. It's about one thing, as Kierkegaard said. You know, the older I get, the more that statement stays in my heart, that the saint is someone whose life is about one thing. You wake up in the morning, okay, my day will be variegated. My day will have all sorts of things and different people I'm meeting, and I'll be playing and working, and I'll be sleeping and so on. But it's finally all about one thing. It's about Christ and following his will. When St. Ignatius asks us to do an examination of consciousness, that's what he's doing. He's saying, okay, can you look back at your day and say it was about one thing? It, it hung together around one point. That's what I mean by finding the center and how Christ is the middle of the rose window around whom all the other elements arrange themselves. Uh, That's what you're going for in in life. So how do we do that? I mean, practically, when we're praying, when we're worshiping, how how do we find the center? Well, that's why, as you're suggesting correctly, uh, prayer is so indispensable to Christian life. If you say, well, I'm a dedicated Christian, how often do you pray? Oh, you know, once a month or so. Well, you're never going to find the center that way. So all the disciplines of prayer, the Mass itself, uh, in the paramount sense, but all the forms of centering prayer, for example, contemplative prayer, the rosary, all these are practices of the center. So this morning, I'm recording this at my residence out in Santa Barbara, woke up, got a cup of coffee, and uh, went down to my chapel. I have the great luxury of having a chapel right here in my residence, and spent an hour uh, praying my office, but praying the rosary, at least part of it this morning. Um, but 
you know, staring at the Blessed Sacrament. That's it. You're you're finding the center. That's what my my life today should be about, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and Lord, give me the strength and courage to do that. Um, but all those are disciplines of finding the center. That's where prayer and contemplation, uh, the office, the mass, the sacraments, that's where they all come in. Talk about in the rose window, you've often said it's it kind of represents the wheel of time that spins round and round. Sometimes you're at the top, sometimes you're at the bottom. But if you place your priority on anything around the periphery of this wheel, you're bound to be disappointed. Yeah, that's another uh, wheel that's found in the medieval uh, cathedrals, and I've always been moved by that. It's a very simple idea, but boy, does it cut to people's hearts, as I've taught it now over the years. The idea, you're right, is this great wheel of fortune, and and let's face it, that's life. Um, Your health, your wealth, your influence, your fame, your power, what are they like? Well, you know, they, they come and go. They rise and fall. They turn. Think of someone who's starting his career, you know, and full of hope and aspiration, legitimately. And he achieves and, and gets a certain amount of fame and pleasure and power. But see, what's the one thing you know, absolutely for sure, is the wheel's going to turn? Because how long do we live? You know, we live, the Bible says 70 years, 80 for those who are strong. Who lives beyond, you know, 95 or 100? So the point is, that's life. You know, you're on your way up, you reach a certain eminence, and then inevitably you go into decline. Fine, that's life. The wheel turns. Or things happen. You get sick, or you, your business fails, or your friendships fall apart, you know? The point is, as you said, don't live your life on the rim of the wheel. Oh, I'm, I'm up on top. And even when you're up on top, maybe especially when you're up on top, you live in anxiety, don't you? Because how long will I be here? Uh, how long can I make it? Talk to business people. Talk to movie makers. Talk to big wheelers and dealers. They're petrified <laughs> when they're at the top. Don't live there. Don't live on the rim of the wheel. Live in Christ. The Bible says the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then, I've always said, you can watch the wheel go around with a certain detachment. And there's that wonderful spiritual idea, dear to Ignatius and many others, detachment. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm doing pretty well right now. I'm I'm wealthy enough, I'm famous enough, or whatever. It's going to go. It's going to pass. Or, you know, I'm not wealthy. I'm not famous. Yeah, yeah, so it goes. So it goes. The wheel turns. Look at all the biblical figures, the great heroes of the Bible. They all they all experience the, the wheel of fortune. Everybody does. And the point is, don't live there. So what does Jesus say, for example? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and the rest will be given unto you. You know what I'm saying? You know what he's saying is, there's the one thing you should be seeking, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do what God wants. And the rest will kind of take care of itself. You know, Don't fuss about it too much. That's why, again, Ignatius says, you know, take, Lord, receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my entire will. You gave it to me. I give it back to you. And so I don't care, he goes on. If I have a long life or a short life, I don't care if I'm wealthy or poor. I don't care if I'm healthy or sick, as long as I've given my life to you. Now, easy to say all this stuff, <laughs> yeah, but man, oh man, that's the, that's the work of a lifetime. That's the work of a lifetime and beyond, uh, to find the center in that way. Whenever you read the lives of the saints, one thing that jumps out almost immediately is their keen sense of their own sinfulness. You know, for us looking at them from the outside, we think, oh, they're nearly impeccable. You know, they're almost perfect in their holiness. But they themselves, in their own uh, autobiographies and memoirs and letters and diaries, you find that they see themselves as some of God's most sinful creatures. That takes us here to this second path to holiness, knowing you're a sinner. Why is that so important? Oh, my gosh. And, and your first observation is really right, a very important one. Because, you know, when you read the saints, like the little flower is a good example, and she'll say, oh, I'm the worst sinner on the planet. and No one's worse than I am. And you think, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, come on. It's like false modesty or something. But see, it's not. It's not. It's the mark of the saint. Because as I mentioned before, the saint has turned her life toward the light. You've turned all of you. What most of us do, by the way, is we, we turn a little bit of our lives maybe toward the light. You know, we give God a little bit of time and all that. But if, if you're saying, no, no, I'm going to turn my whole life 
over to Christ, what's going to happen? You're going to notice much more readily what's off in you, what's imperfect in you, what's problematic in you. That's why it's the saints who especially know they are sinners. And I I really adapted that line from Chesterton, you know, who said, oh, there are saints in my religion. Those are people that know they are sinners. It's really good, you know. The the trouble with most of us is we don't think we're so bad. (laughs) You know, I'm doing okay. That's a sign that you're probably not driving toward the light. (laughs) You're, You're driving away from the light. So you say, hey, I'm okay and you're okay. Look at now modern secularism. Unless I'm committing mass murder, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm fine. No, no, if, if you're as turned toward the light, that means the light of Christ is getting into every nook and cranny of you. Your external life, your internal life, your friendships, but also your motivations, you know. That light's going deep down within you. What's going to happen is all the little things that hide in the darkness start scurrying around and you'll notice them. Right, I mean, you could be perfectly fine. There could be all kinds of vermin in your bathroom if you leave the light off, but you turn the light on. Oh, there they are. I didn't even know they were there. Same with the spiritual life. You turn the light of Christ on in every room, in every closet, every nook and every cranny, you're going to start seeing a lot of things that aren't right. And so that's what happens. It's not so much a resolution. It's a consequence of path one. If you really found the center, you will ipso facto Understand you're a sinner. Now, you asked about the importance of it. Here's why it's so important. And read all the masters on this. If, if you're bedeviled by all kinds of sins that you haven't seen, much less dealt with, then you're not ready for God's service. See, God wants to use us. That's the whole, I don't take that in a negative way. To be used by God is the greatest joy, you know. So God wants to use us to bring his presence to the world. But he can't use us if we're like a faulty tool. If, if you're a carpenter, you got a hammer, the hammer's all broken, and that head keeps coming off, it won't do any good. You got a screwdriver, but it's a lousy screwdriver. So God wants to use us as his instruments. But if we're a mess, then he won't be able to use us well. The whole point, for example, of the Ignatian exercises is to prepare soldiers. You know, Am I ready to be commanded by the general? Um, I, I've joined the army, and I want to do what he wants, but I'm a mess. I'm a lousy soldier, so I've got to get cleansed and purified. So that's the importance of path two, where you deal with all of your hang-ups, your attachments, your concupiscence, your sin, your errant desire. And at the end of that process, now you're ready for mission. You know, The the great biblical image, the two I often go back to, are Isaiah and St. Peter. So the call of Isaiah, when he has the great vision of Yahweh in the temple, and wow, there it is, you know, the transcendent glory of God. But then immediately Isaiah says, I, I'm a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. And that was code for sin, you know. So God purifies him, sends the angel with the, uh, the seraph, you know, with the burning uh, uh, coal, purifies the mouth of Isaiah. Beautiful image. Now he can speak. St. Peter, same thing, is called by Christ. The miraculous draft of fishes follows. Peter has discovered the Messiah. And what's his first move? Lord, leave me. I'm, I'm a sinful man. I mean, Peter probably knew that, I'm sure. But in the presence of the light of Christ, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a sinner. What does Jesus do is he cleanses him, purifies him, and sends him. From now on, you'll be, I'll make you a fisher of men. So, right, by the way, those are very good examples of the three paths on a succinct display. Find the center. Both Isaiah and Peter, this great light broke in. No, you're a sinner. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. Leave me. And then mission. So the Lord then says to Isaiah, having been purified, go, go as a prophet. Peter, go. I'll make you a fisher of men. That They show beautifully the rhythm of the three paths. Flannery O'Connor, the great Southern Catholic novelist, has a wonderful short story called Revelation. Mm-hmm. And that title sort of alludes to the revelation of one of the characters of her sinfulness. You love this story. Uh, give us a little overview of how it images this second path. Yeah, it's about this woman named Mrs. Turpin. And of course, the, the word Turpin is a lot like terrapin, you know, like a, like a tortoise with a shell. And this is a woman who is totally convinced of her own righteousness. And she's there in a doctor's uh, waiting room and all kinds of people around and, you know, kind of the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And she's 
in her interior monologue, uh, judging all of them. And she's noticing how poorly dressed they are and the poor white trash and look at this one. And she's very judgmental. And in the corner, she sees a, a young girl, like a teenager. And she's kind of slouched in the corner as a lousy uh, dress on, looks terrible, hair disheveled. And Mrs. Turpin really lets her have it in her interior monologue. But then, when Mrs. Turpin announces aloud to everybody how, just how happy she is because God has given her so many great things. With that, the young girl throws a book at Mrs. Turpin, hits her in the head, knocks her off of her chair. And uh, the doctor comes out and starts tending to Mrs. Turpin. But as she fades into unconsciousness, she hears the, the girl across the room say, you are a warthog from hell. <laughs> and what's wonderful is then we discover the, the girl's name, which is Mary Grace. And the point she's making, of course, typical Flannery O'Connor style, is that grace, which means the breakthrough of God's love into our world, right? God's love in an unmerited way breaks into our world. Grace often hurts. Grace is an is a, um, invasion, breaking through the terrapin, breaking through the shell of what? Her own self-righteousness, her own self-justification. Hey, I'm great. My life is great. All these poor other people, God help them, but I'm doing great. Grace is what broke through and <laughs> convinced her, yeah, I am a warthog from hell. <laughs> I mean, I'm a sinner who's in desperate need of grace like every other sinner. Um, and that's what she was so good at telling stories like that, how grace doesn't tickle. Grace is not a walk in the park. You know, grace can be a very dire business because the Lord's got to break through a lot of things. That's all part of path too. If you've got a good spiritual director, someone that's not going to molly coddle you, but a good spiritual director, they'll do that work with you. They'll, they won't allow you to play games of self-deception. They won't allow you to say, I'm okay and you're okay. They're going to look for the places in you that need illumination. Um, so Flannery O'Connor is one of the best spiritual directors in the 20th century. So the first path to holiness is finding the sinner. The second path is knowing you're a sinner. The third path is your life is not about you. Well, if it's not about me, what is it about? It's about Christ who wants to live his life in you, right? As Paul says, one of the most important lines in Christian spirituality when Paul says, it's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. What's he talking about there? But it's the old self has died. It's the old self, which is covered like a, like a tortoise. It's defensive. It's self-interested. It's looking after itself for money and power and pleasure and honor. That's the old self. The old self has to be um, shattered. It's got to be illumined. It's got to be wrecked. It's got to be pierced through, whatever metaphor you want to use so that the true self can emerge. The true self is Christ living his life in me. Now, mind you, it doesn't mean I become a robot, like I'm emptied out. It means the false self has been shattered, absolutely. But now the true self is my, to use technical language, my cooperation with grace. Christ wants to live his life in me with my cooperation, living, I mean, my life. So right now, you know, I'm the auxiliary bishop of Los Angeles. I'm here in Santa Barbara doing various things. Um, I've got all kinds of responsibilities. Fine, good, good. But can that be transformed in such a way that it's Christ living his life in and through that life? There's the spiritual thing. That's realizing my life is not about me. It's not about the false self. It's about letting Christ live in me. And that might be totally at odds with, with my dreams. Say, oh, I want to do this and that. I want to be this and that. I want people to think this. Oh, so what? And that's all false self. What does Christ want? So when I was in front of the Blessed Sacrament this morning, you know, in my imperfect way, that's what I was asking. Okay, what, what do you want? What do you want today? How do you want to live your life in me? Um, there's path three. And how do, what do we know from the Bible? We know it's always a path of mission. It's all, whatever, it'll take a million forms, depending on what Christ wants and, and the culture and your personality and all that. But it's always mission. I'm sending you to be my presence in the world. That's why when the little flower says, you know, my vocation is love. Remember, she has that kind of crisis of vocation. of She wants to be a great teacher. She wants to be missionary. She wants to be martyr. She wants to be... And she realized, look, here I am, this little 
Carmel, you know, in Lisieux, how can I do all those things? And then she realized, but underneath all of them is love. That's what unites the martyr and the teacher and the, and the contemplative and so on. So, okay, in her typical kind of over-the-top way, okay, that's it. I found my vocation. My vocation is to be love in the heart of the church. And you say, well, how sweet and sentimental. It's not sweet and sentimental at all. Because what that means is every nook and cranny of my life, even in this little out-of-the-way you know, convent, every aspect of my life now is turned to love. It'll be turned into love. Uh, you think that's a walk in the park? Think again, you know. Um, but she got it. See, she got at the heart of path number three. Your life's not about you. Um, but again, that's the work of a lifetime and a work of a lot of prayer and sacraments and grace. Um, and that's in some ways the culminating point of the three paths. They're meant to conduce to that point. Because you won't be able to live that unless you found the center. And you will not be able to live it unless you've come to terms with your sin. And so it's the, it's the conclusion of the, uh, of the three paths. Whenever you discuss this third path that your life is not about you, you often contrast two different worldviews. One is the ego drama and one is the theodrama. What do you mean by each of those two terms? Yeah, that's from Balthazar, uh, you know, arguably the greatest Catholic theologian of the last century. But Balthazar distinguishes in his anthropology and, and his ecclesiology between these two paths. The ego drama is a drama. It's a play that's being uh, written directed, produced, and above all, starred in by me. It's the, it's the theater of the false self, if you want. You know, the self that's, that's preoccupied with all the ego needs. And it acts out this drama. And see, all the sinners are in the ego drama to a degree. Um, okay, I wake up in the morning. Let's see, how am I going to produce this drama today? And how am I going to get my bit players lined up? And how will I emerge more and more as a star of this drama? And then when I go to bed at night to think, oh, yeah, that was a lousy you know, production because I didn't get what I wanted. They didn't cooperate with me. Um, that's the ego drama. Notice me. Um, watch me achieve what I want to achieve. See, Balthazar's point is ho-hum. I and mean, the ego drama is so dull. That's the problem with it. Because all I'm doing is cooking up some schema of my own. You know, What's really exciting is the theodrama. The theodrama is the play being written by God, uh, directed by God, produced by God, and starring, starring the Christ who lives within you. See, the ego, the false self, is not the star. He's been, he's been relegated to the sidelines. You, know, you go back to the dressing room. The star is now Christ living his life in you. And even though it might have no resemblance to the ego drama, again, that's, Ignatius is so good on that. Um, it's not your plans. It's not what you look forward to, but it's what God wants for you. And that's always better. That's always better. Will always make you happier. See? So shift things around. Don't worry about the ego drama. No, they didn't notice me. I didn't get the attention I wanted. Who cares? So what? So what? It'll just make you unhappy anyway. Don't worry about that one. Worry about the theodrama. Okay, Lord, how do you want to live your life in me today? Um, even, there's a little flower again, the stupidest, simplest things. Well, I can at least make that an occasion to bring the love of God into the world. That's the drama you should be worrying about. And these two contrasting dramas are on wonderful display in one of your favorite movies, A Man for All Seasons, in this yeah. scene between Thomas More, the great saint, and Richie Rich. Tell us about that scene. Yeah, it's one of my favorites in that great, great play. If, if the listeners have not read the play or seen the magnificent movie with Paul Schofield as Thomas More. Don't walk, but run right now to wherever you run. We used to say to the video store. Don't, <laughs> they don't have this. <laughs> no, 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 just run to your Netflix or whatever you run to. But get it, get it. Or watch it on, look up this scene on YouTube. I bet it's there. Um, Richard Rich was a real historical figure, eventually became uh, Chancellor of, of England. When the play opens, he's a young guy just out of college, like early 20s, full of ambition, full of the world. That's why his name, though it's a real name, is beautifully used by the playwright. I'm Richard Rich. Uh, this is a guy that wants to fill up his ego with lots of good things. What he's seeking for more is uh, a position at court because Thomas More is a major player in the court of Henry VIII. So like a lot of young, you see him today, 
just out of college, hanging around prominent people looking for a big job. And Moore puts him off, puts him off, because Moore has read his soul. See, Moore understands this kid that he's not ready for that kind of power. Someone like Thomas Moore, yeah, because he, he, was, he was so spiritually advanced, he could handle that kind of position, but he knew that Richard Rich could not. But finally, he says, uh, there's an opening for you. There's a position in this school. And Richard Rich is completely <laughs> mortified because he wants to be a big dealer at court, and he's being offered a job as a teacher in a local you know, school. And Moore um, tries to encourage him and says, you know, you could be a good teacher, even a great one. And Richard Rich fires back at him. And if I were, who would know it? See, and there's a beautiful hint of, of the ego drama. That's the way it works and thinks, you know. So I can be the best teacher in the world, but who would know about it? I wouldn't be famous for it. And Moore responds beautifully. Watch it on YouTube. Um, so who would notice? Yourself, your friends, your students, God. Not a bad public, that. And see, but it goes right over the head of Richard Ray. He doesn't get that at all. It goes right over his head. I, don't, I want the, the glitterati to be my public. But more realizes, I mean, having God, God's your public. God's the one that you're playing to, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but how often do you think about that? I'll ask all of our listeners. How often, I ask myself, how often do you think of it? That the audience I'm playing to is God. <laughs> you know, it's not anyone here below. Uh, talk about the, uh, the wheel of fortune, you know, up and down. You know, what if it's the case that you are really admired, but by all the wrong people? <laughs> It's the, a bunch of idiots are admiring you. So I'm famous, and oh boy, everyone thinks I'm something. But they're all idiots. <laughs> you're, you're playing to the wrong crowd. If, if nothing but saints thought the world of you, okay, that's all right. I can live with that. You know, Because they reflect, finally, the judgment of God. Uh, so your life will change. Trust me, your life will change. If you say, I'm not going to live the ego drama, but I'm going to live the theodrama. Time now for our weekly question. Uh, you can ask a question of Bishop Barron anytime by visiting askbishopbarron.com and recording your own question. And today we have a wonderful question from Sister Miriam James from Texas. I'll go ahead and play it now. Hi, Bishop Barron. My name is Sister Miriam James, and I live in Corpus Christi, Texas. And I was wondering if you could explain the relationship between mercy and justice. And I hear a lot of people in this year of mercy speaking of how mercy cancels out justice, and it, there's a, it just seems to be a muddled relationship between the two. And I would love to hear your explanation on how they're profoundly related, especially as our Holy Father is calling us to be merciful like the Father in this wonderful year. So thank you so much. God bless you. Well, thanks, sister. That's a, it's a great question. And it's a very uh, important one. And I think you're right that people can get sort of a muddled sense of this. How would I put it? Well, first of all, I'll go back to justice. Uh, Plato gave us the best definition of justice, which is rendering to each his due. And actually, that's a, that's a great spiritual guide, I find, as you go through your day. What's due to this person? So, for example, any human being, you'd say, well, as a child of God, as a creature of God, is due my respect and my kindness and so on. That's why I greet people on the street. I don't just brush by them. I say, good morning, hello. It's, it's a simple act of justice. Now, uh, extrapolate from that. So whenever someone is do something and you render it to him, so think of a, a teacher. A teacher owes his students his good work and his preparation and his good teaching. I used to tell the seminarians uh, at Mundelein that they owed their bishop, and they owed the people of God. They're coming to class, you know, because that's due to them, that they prepare themselves well for the, uh, for the priesthood. So I said, missing class is not just, eh, you know, I blew off class today. It's an injustice. It's a lack of justice. Um, I owe the people of uh, Los Angeles my ministry and my prayer and my love because I'm, I'm their, the auxiliary bishop here. So go through all of life. Whenever you render to someone what is due to him, or, for example, a murderer comes before a judge, and a judge says, I sentence you to life imprisonment. Well, what is that but an act of justice? Because you're rendering to him what is due to him precisely as a convicted murderer. Someone who, look at the language, owes a debt to society. 
See, so th- that's the language of justice. God is not only just, God is justice itself, which is why justice can never be abrogated. It's, it's never appropriate to say, I'm going to be less than just, because that means I, I'm running a, a, a thwart God. I'm standing a, a, a over and against God. Okay, so what's mercy? Mercy, you know, the word itself, misericordia, has the sense of the suffering heart. It's a very emotional kind of word. It's, it's a very uh, affective um, word, the suffering of the heart. I've said mercy is what love looks like when it turns toward the sinner. So love, willing the good of the other, feels the suffering of the, of the sinner or of the bedraggled person, whatever it is. Mercy, therefore, in the great tradition, can go beyond justice, if I can put it that way. It can mock justice, as the Bible puts it, but don't take that in the wrong way. It doesn't mean it's less than justice or it abrogates justice. Rather, it's a gesture of love that goes beyond the demand of justice. Beyond it, never beneath it. Just as I've often argued, faith is never less than reason. See, that's why if say to all the new atheists and the kids who are worried about that. Faith is never less than reason. What's less than reason is superstition or stupidity or whatever. Faith is a grasp of truth that goes beyond reason. So in a way, you could say justice, or rather mercy, never is less than or underneath justice. Rather, it's an expression of love that goes beyond the demands of justice. Well, thanks again for joining us for the Word on Fire show. We have links to all of the resources that we've mentioned here on the website, wordonfireshow.com slash episode six. I wanted to highlight two resources in particular. Uh, Bishop Barron has gone into much greater depth into these three paths of holiness in a book and a DVD. The book is called The Strangest Way. You can find a link to that at wordonfireshow.com. And there's also his Untold Blessing DVD study program. This is great because you can go through it either by yourself or in a group of people. So if you have a small group at your parish, it'd be a wonderful program to dig into these three paths to holiness. Again, we invite you to submit your questions for Bishop Barron by visiting askbishopbarron.com. And please, uh, we also invite you to leave a review of this podcast on iTunes. It's a big help to us. It would only take you a few seconds, but it would make a big difference for this show because it would help get it in front of more people. So please leave a review of the Word on Fire show. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week on the Word on Fire show.